Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to another Room for Discussion interview. My name is Ella. This is Filippo. We're going to be the interviewers today. Um, if you think back to the last few weeks, chances are that you saw quite a few headlines about China. Uh, this might have been about their economic rivalry with the US, their economic health, or perhaps Taiwan's recent elections. But no matter what, uh, China is undoubtedly and also justifiably a huge topic right now. With us today. Oh, so you're also muted, maybe? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh. Yeah, OK, great. So with us today to talk about the role of China in today's world is Bert Hoffman. Mr. Hoffman had a 20-year-long career in the World Bank, mostly in the East Asia region. He spent five years as a country director for China between 2014 and 2019. And he's here today to share some insights on China. So without any further ado, please welcome him on our stage with a round of applause. All right, let's do Thank this. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> so, welcome very much to Room for Discussion. Um, before we get to this, the heavy content part of this interview, we thought it would be fun to get to know you a little bit better. Something that Filippo and I found very interesting when we were doing research was that uh, despite doing your studies here in the Netherlands, uh, you never actually worked here, but you uh, stayed your whole life after you left outside the Netherlands. So did you always want to live this expat life? Uh, well, it, it, it was a bit opportunistic, frankly. I mean, after my studies in Rotterdam, I went to Kiel University out of all places, did a course there for a year. And then there was an opportunity came up at the OECD. And I said, well, hey, why not? Paris? <coughs> I wasn't paid very much, but it was fun to be in Paris. And from then, I started getting interested in development. And that was really the World Bank in the days was you know, the, the center of development thinking. I'm not sure that it still is. Mm. And so I tried to find a way to get to the World Bank. And that was really through going back to Germany Oh. I went back to Germany, and then the wall fell, the Berlin Wall fell, and the whole of Eastern Europe opened up, and I got sort of, I rolled into all these transition issues and started studying that at the University of Kiel. Mm -hmm. But then the World Bank said, why don't you come and do that for the World Bank? And then it became China, which was also in transition. So that was... A little bit how I ended up in China. Yeah. Uh, my, first, my first work on China was in 1992. 1992. Yeah. Well, the World Bank entered China a few years earlier, in the 1980, as part of the um, Deng Xiaoping's open door policy. What's one notable difference in the way the World Bank operated in China back in the day and when you finished your position? Well, so, so there's, a, there's a famous, there's a famous quote, which we don't even know, it was not in the official records, but the people that were in the room said that Deng Xiaoping, mm -hmm. the leader who triggered reforms in China, he said to Robert McNamara, the president of the World Bank, uh, he said something like, well, we'd really like the World Bank to help us, uh, because we know that we have fallen behind, we want to learn from the rest of the world, and the World Bank can be useful for us. If you help us, we will achieve our purposes faster. If you don't help us, we will still get there. <laughs> now, I think, I think that set the tone. So China has, even though the objectives have been changing, but they always more or less knew what they were about. And for Deng Xiaoping, it was marketization, opening up to the outside world, and then look around what would be useful for getting that done. Uh, Xi Jinping today has very different objectives but also is quite purpose-driven in understanding what would be useful for meeting those purposes and what not. So I think, I think very strong leadership for the World Bank is important. In other countries that I've worked on, some of the leadership was maybe not as strong or they didn't quite know as much what they wanted to do with the country. And then, frankly, the World Bank is a little naughty. Then they start inventing things of what would be good for that country. And that quite often doesn't work out. Mm. Yeah, and as country director for China, you had first row seats uh, to what's been called the economic miracle. However, in the last couple of years or so, you've seen a significant growth slowdown. So if you would take the pandemic out of the equation here, uh, if that's something you can do, 
Did you see this coming? Uh, well, I think we can honestly say that we, that we saw it coming because it's natural. Mm -hmm. It's natural if countries get richer, then at some point growth will slow. And that's in part because you get closer to what economists call the, the, the technology frontier. So it's less easier to adopt ideas from the rest of the world because you already done it. And you need to invent more yourself. Uh, the second thing, very important for China, is that demographics had a very important turn in the last 10 years. Uh, and that the mobilizing people from the countryside to employ them mm. in the city, in manufacturing and in services, was no longer an option. So a very strong demographic change that also leads to a slowdown in the, in the economy. The third, and that's more specific to China, the third is really that maybe the world is now a bit more skeptical about China. Mm -hmm. They were very welcoming. It was enormously important. China's entry in the WTO was enormously important for the country. The, the, the highest growth decade was after the year 2000 when China entered. Uh, but now people think, I don't necessarily agree, but a lot of people think here and, and in the United States that China did not love, live up to its obligation. Mm. And so there's increasingly resistance to, to China's exports, to China's economic development. And second, uh, there is now more concern about security issues. Uh, we don't have to hide that. Look, w when, when a country becomes the second largest economy in the world, or the largest economy in the world, depending on how you, how you phrase that, uh, national security becomes more important for the country, but there's also more concern outside the country with national yeah, security. Course. And that's now playing out between the United States, which is still the number one, still the most powerful nation in the world, but mm -hmm. they don't necessarily like the competition from China. So those tensions, they translate into, into trade sanctions, into tariffs, into technology restrictions to China, and, and undoubtedly that slows China down a little mm. bit. Yeah. So, so look, for China is now at $12,000 per capita, which is... Not bad, and no. it's almost a high-income country, but not quite yet. But the experience is that after you reach that level of income, sort of the decade after, you no longer grow as fast. And, and 4 to 5% is a very reasonable exp expectation of growth over the next decade. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the most clear examples of the growth slowdown we're seeing is the real estate market crisis. Why are we seeing this happen? Oh, goodness. <laughs> Question. Well, supply is larger than demand, an economist would say. <laughs> Look, this goes really back to the global financial crisis where um, China, being very export dependent at the time, ran into trouble because the US imploded, the economy imploded, the growth went negative. Same with Europe. And China said, okay, we, we can't have that. We can't have this negative growth. And they started a very big stimulus. Mm. And it was in part fiscal spending, but in part it was also telling local governments, okay, you can develop faster. And the way that happened was in part through real estate, i.e. they developed the real estate market much more rapidly. They allowed real estate developers to acquire land and with that to, to build more housing. And that was all fine until there was really an oversupply. Mm -hmm. That was recognized by the government already well before COVID and well before, well before it became a problem. And they wanted to correct it. Then COVID happened and they couldn't correct it because growth was still important. But in 2020, after China overcame the first wave of COVID and they thought it was the last, they said, okay, now we're going to do this real estate bubble. We're going to yeah. address it. And they introduced something which was called the three red line policies. The China always has very poetic names for their policies. Yeah. The three red line. And uh, oh, that's my mic again. <laughs> which limited credit to real estate developers. As a consequence, those developers ran into trouble. People started doubting whether these real estate developers could finish housing. And everybody started to walk away from real estate. Yeah. Mm. So. Production and investment in housing is way down, about 40% from the peak. 
prices are still holding up, but frankly, it's a little bit the question, are these prices very real? Yeah. Yeah. The official price level is 4 or 5% down. In some cities where they're way overbuilt, it's probably down a lot more. Yeah. And that affects confidence of people. So it's, it's one of the big issues that is currently on, uh, on uh, China's government's plate. And I don't think the solution is there yet. Yeah, well, Cato Institute, a libertarian think tank, thinks that a major cause for this overbuilding is a lack of alternative investment options in a socialist economy like China. To what extent do you agree with this? Um, hmm. I think it's an interesting proposition. I, I don't think I necessarily agree. I mean, there's lots of interesting investments to, to be done. Uh, but for individuals, they have, A, they have a lack of... It's still a very imperfect social security. The pension system is still uh, quite underdeveloped, especially for, uh, ur for rural residents. B, for individuals' investment, you have your bank account or the stock market or your real estate. Now, real estate traditionally in China, and not just Chinese in China, but also Chinese elsewhere, such as Singapore, hmm. They really like to invest in real estate. So there was a real demand for that real estate investment. And for, for 20 years, it was a fantastic investment mm. with 8 to 10% rates of returns every year. So that demand side was also quite high. But if you look at demographics and if you look at sort of normal demand, probably, I mean, the overbuilding has gone on over the past three, four years. The current stock of housing is going to supply for the next five years. They don't need any more housing. And the real estate sector is really going to end up a lot smaller than uh, it was before this crisis in 2019. And so where do you see the investments going? Well, uh, if you think about individual investments, because, I mean, China still has a lot of savings. And yep. China saves 45% of its national income. And those savings have to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. Uh, in part, it will be infrastructure, and particularly green infrastructure. There are still a lot of investments to be done in China. China is doing a lot in uh, renewable energy, but they should do a lot more. They're still for 60% dependent on coal, and that's not great for the rest of the world. The investments needed to make their green transition is enormous. So some of those savings could end up there. But of course, the individuals need to have the vehicles to get there and still have a return. And that could be through banks or it could be through investment companies. That's coming up now. And I think that's going to play a more important role. Second, China is getting really good in tech. And mm -hmm. a, a lot of people here seem to be concerned about electric vehicles and, yeah, the and, EV and, other, wave. and other tech. <laughs> but, but um, you know, that, there's still a long way to go for China in investing in those industries. So it's not that China is running out of investment. After all, it's only a $12,000 per capita economy, yeah. not a 50000 like the United States. But so the way that this, uh, the real estate crisis is covered in uh, a lot of Western media, it's in quite apocalyptic tones. So what I'm getting from you is that the situation is perhaps not really as dire as it's made out to be. Well, th I mean, may maybe I'm a cynical economist, but the damage is already done, mm -hmm. i.e., this stuff is built, and quite a bit of that is not going to be very useful, or far less useful than it should be. That means that you have a finance problem, mm -hmm. and it means that in the past, you allocated too much of your investment resources to stuff that you don't need, or not, not, don't need as much of. That's a waste, but that's done. Yeah. The critical issue is now how to prevent this real estate problem to become a general financial crisis and then economic crisis. And that's what happened in the United States, if you recall, during the global financial crisis, where the subprime mortgage crisis, which was a very small part of the market, but in the end snowballed into a, huge a big economic, a global economic crisis. Yeah. So, so chi China should do a number of things. I'm not sure whether they're doing enough yet. They've been trying to do some. What they're basically trying to do is, is give enough money to real estate developers. So a little bit loosening up this three red line policy to make sure that they finish housing under construction because that would leave a lot of people unhappy if they don't get finished. Yes. But second, a lot of those are really bankrupt. Mm -hmm. So the financial consequences of that would need to be managed. 
the banking system is going to take a hit. But the banking system is all state-owned, mm -hmm. and it means that they're going to be less profitable, or maybe even some loss-making, but the state can still absorb that. The third fallout is on local government finances. Yeah. Because local governments, remember, they started the stimulus with, these real, with this real estate game. They benefited by land sales. Land sales made up almost one-third of revenues before the COVID crisis. Mm -hmm. That's gone. Mm -hmm. For that, a reform needs to happen that hasn't been discussed yet, a major change in the intergovernmental fiscal system in China. So the state would need to, A, probably raise more taxes, but B, allocate a lot more to local governments than they currently do. Um, Total restructuring, yeah. I've been arguing for that for a while, but I don't think anybody's <laughs> listening. <laughs> well, let's take the worst case scenario then. What economic consequences are we looking at, both domestically and internationally? Well, look, I, I don't think you can, you can take the real estate sector completely in isolation. But, but, uh, and the, the worst case scenario would be um, yeah, a, a much more bigger financial, uh, financial yeah. impact mm -hmm. and therefore reduce demand because depositors don't get as much returns on their investment and therefore consumption demand will decline. China's imports will decline, mm -hmm. and therefore everybody is worse off. Yeah. China's real estate sector, there's a lot of debate on how big it actually is, and, and embarrassingly, economists can't really figure it out. But if you look at the national income accounts, it's about 12% of GDP. Mm -hmm. If you look at it indirectly, it might be double, whatever goes okay. all into that real estate sector. But if it's 12% of GDP, and you're going to end up with a, a real estate sector that's maybe 60% of that size, it's 8% of GDP. So you lose 4% of GDP. That's not trivial, but it's not 20% of Chinese economy. Yeah. So I still see it as a manageable, in a, even in a fairly dire scenario, I still see it as a manageable problem. But it needs constant care and innovative policies. So, um, oh, great. Um, the real estate crisis is uh, only one of seemingly simultaneous challenges that China's economy is facing. So you mentioned a little bit they need to restructure their um, governmental structure. They have a youth unemployment problem. And they have huge local debts, uh, so local government debts. Um, so are these symptoms of a larger, more fundamental economic structural issue? Uh, well, it's the big debate. Oops. I don't know what I'm still... I think like, so, yeah. It's, it's, it's the big debate as is currently happening. So some say, okay, this is the end of the China model. Mm -hmm. It couldn't have worked from the start. State-led development was a bad idea. And yes, they did okay for a while, just like the Soviet Union did. But this is the end of it. I, I tend not to agree with that. Yeah. But then the second question, the sec there's two other opinions. One is, oh, this is just a cyclical thing. Mm -hmm. And China has figured out the future. It goes into high tech. It goes into EVs. It goes into wind and solar, and that's those are the new the new industries. It goes into into biotech and and all of that. And so, so it's just this transition to that new future, which is already figured out. And it's just a a few blips on the radar screen. Nothing to worry about. Uh, I'm more in the structural issues mm -hmm. that there are real structural issues in China that need policy solutions, and some of them are on the way, but others are yet to be implemented. And, and the way I, I mean, you, you have your own phrasing of the, uh, of the problems. The way I talk to Chinese policymakers, I say you have a, a, a problem in 4D. Mm -hmm. So the first D is demographics, because you're running out of people. The second D is um, in demand. Your domestic demand is not strong enough. That is in part, I think I'm losing. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> Here we go again. Nice. With glasses, this doesn't work as well. <laughs> <laughs> I think now it's, yeah. The third D is decoupling with the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And the fourth D uh, is somewhere in my mind. Let's, but let's focus on, the, on these three Ds. Uh, first, now the demographics issue is, is very much played up. It gets entangled in the real estate side. 
yeah. in the real estate uh, uh, discussion. But really, I am, I'm less convinced that demographics is going to kill China's growth, in part because they can still reform a lot uh, to maintain the labor force at the level that is still quite productive. And second, the people that are coming now in the labor force are so much better educated and so much better uh, uh, trained and therefore more productive than the ones that are currently leaving the labor force. If you look at it, it's quite stunning. The, the people leaving the labor force, they have maybe six years of education total. Yeah. The ones coming into the labor force, they have at least 12, but quite often 18 years of, of, of education. So a huge difference between the two, and frankly, it's unrecognizable. Um, and the third is that still China has a lot of labor allocated to relatively unproductive, uh, relatively unproductive tasks. Agriculture still has 25% of the labor force. It should probably be something like eight or six. And it requires lots of reforms in agriculture, but once you do, you free up a lot of labor for much more productive activities in manufacturing and services, wherever it's more productive. So, so I don't think demographics is really the bottleneck for China. But lots of issues to be dealt with. The pension system, as we mentioned, is, is quite weak, and China is aging more. Mm. And so they need to fix that, um, which is not easy. These four Ds are a great framework to think about this. So you know, just to reiterate them, if I'm right, demographic, debt, decoupling, and demand. Yes. Right. So let's zoom into demand a bit, because mm. I believe it's quite interesting. Why is it so sluggish right now? Well, in part, it's this real estate issue, okay. right? We have, we have people that are, have invested heavily in property, and suddenly not the only way of prices is not up, but it's sideways or maybe down. That brings a lot of uncertainty into households, and so they're quite hesitant to spend. Uh, second, uh, the current government has, is really switching majorly from this real estate infrastructure to high tech, mm. to hard tech, i.e. manufacturing. The current leader, Xi Jinping, loves manufacturing. Mm. And it means that a lot of people that were trained for the services sector that were trained to be coders for Alibaba or Tencent, they can't find jobs. So youth unemployment is a real issue. And if you've just invested quite a bit of your savings into your son's or daughter's education and they can't find a job, that brings a lot of uncertainty. Of course. The third demand factor is this local government. They suddenly miss out on one third of their revenues. So they can't spend like they used to. It means that domestic demand is really quite low. Uh, exports is increasing, especially exports of stuff, of manufacturing is increasing. And that causes some havoc around the world. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of analysts that talk about, uh, and I think this is what you're hinting at as well, that China should move from being an investment-based economy, like a, typically a developing nation, to a demand-driven economy. Uh, and this would require quite a large change, both um, structurally, but also perhaps culturally or in, in terms of mindset. Um, so what do you think, what are the main things that are standing in China's way of achieving this uh, demand-driven economy, rather? Well, <clears throat> first, uh, China still needs investment, and they still need quite a bit of investment. Mm -hmm. It's not that they're done investing. Yes. In public infrastructure, they're quite high, but as I said, the green transition is coming in now, which requires a lot, not just in China, but a lot around the world in terms of investment. China needs to probably be much smarter in allocating investment, because in part because of aging, future savings are going to be less than today. So the productivity of investment needs to be better. And, and that... Uh, as a, the, the current leadership thinks that's manufacturing. I think there's a lot more to invest in that would have a much higher return mm -hmm. than past investment. That by itself creates the resources for higher wages. It creates the resources for uh, better pension systems. The social side of the equation is China spends about 6-7% in total on social spending in China. In 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 uh, in. Uh, on its economy. It's going to grow because of aging, 
but it's still really low compared to its comparators, i.e. higher middle-income countries, and it's much lower than OECD countries. So some redistribution, especially to poor people in China, would actually help demand, because poor people in China, they don't have the means to save, and they spend. Mm -hmm. The savings rate among poor is much lower than it is among the rich. So if you redistribute income, you actually get a lot more consumption, and that would be helpful for demand. Mm. Do you believe this change will be done in time to offset the more structural issues? We I don't know. I, re I really don't know. And to some extent, I mean, if you were to, if this were the Dutch problem, everybody would say, this is wonderful. You can give away stuff, <laughs> and you can be popular as a, as a, as a, as a politician. It's, it's what happened when I was young in the 70s. It was really the, uh, the fun things for people, as the, the Labour Party at the time introduced, basically a, a lot more social, uh, social welfare and social support. China actually has a very concrete objectives. Xi Jinping loves to talk about common prosperity. Yes. And it really is about the next phase of growth should be more shared. So I think there's a little bit of a, uh, an inc well, not, maybe not an inconsistency, but some contradictions between the ultimate objective and some of the good things that could be done that would help the economy. And they're not happening. Mm -hmm. So I, I, it's a bit of a puzzle. That's, uh, it's also something, this inconsistency you point out, it's uh, because as you mentioned, they are doing quite a lot of stuff to try to achieve this, but at the same time, if you listen to or read the transcript <coughs> of certain uh, Xi Jinping speeches, he's also um, really promoting values like modesty, frugality, conscientiousness. He's uh, not really a fan of lazy people, you could say. Uh, and I think some of these values seem to go a little bit against what you would need to be a really high consumption and low saving type of household. So do you also see that uh, the regime is working against the mindset change that needs to happen, perhaps? Well, Ella, you, you, I mean, your observation is spot on. Xi Jinping, who, nice. grew, who, grew, <laughs> who grew up in, you know, during the Cultural Revolution and, and was sent to the countryside and ate bitterness, as the Chinese saying mm -hmm. goes, so was very poor in very poor circumstances and, and actually sought that in his, the start of his career. So he thinks that's actually good for people, it's career building and... and but it's not good for the economy. No. And today's China is very different from Cultural Revolution China. So I believe that in time, uh, even Xi Jinping gets convinced that a little bit more of social support for, mm -hmm. say, migrant workers, migrant workers who built China, who literally built China, because they're the ones that are in the construction, but they don't have a safety net if they get unemployed. They go back, they go back to the village and supposed to be farmers. Mm -hmm. That doesn't work anymore. That doesn't work in today's China. And I think once it is figured out and, and the systems are being put in place, yes, there's an ideological resistance. I don't think it's going to last. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, zooming out a bit more, um, one of the reasons that, um, Chinese that the Chinese regime remains popular internally is the fact that they've been able to consistently grow and consistently improve the life of their citizenship. If we see, perhaps, you know, a continuous slow down in growth, could this contribute, perhaps, to a threat to the regime? Well, uh, I, I find it in part because I grew up with the current, the current regime, so uh, for 30 years, I find it hard to see a real threat. Okay. But it is of concern, mm -hmm. and social unrest has always been very close to the, to the concerns, to the core concerns of, of Chinese uh, government of the Communist Party of China, and so it may. At the same time, uh, my core scenario, and <laughs> I'm sure the government's core scenario, is not that growth is going to go to zero, or not even to two or three percent. It's still going to be four to five percent uh, uh, in the medium in the medium term. Second, uh, current leadership, Xi Jinping, is emphasizing a lot of other factors. Mm. So for, first of all, uh, it's no longer about growth, it's about quality growth. Now, we, yeah. nobody knows quite what it is, <laughs> but it means that you can always say, well, no, we now have quality growth. Growth is no longer as high, but it's quality growth. Mm -hmm. All right, well, good. So you get legitimacy from quality growth. But the third, of course, is nationalism. And China, like it or not, but they said China is in a situation where they are the emerging power, 
and the United States is the incumbent, and there is tensions, and there's tensions over a number of specific issues, including Taiwan and others. But that reinforces the legitimacy of the regime of the Communist Party of China. So I'm not saying they play that card that hard, and not as a substitute for economic growth, but it is becoming increasingly a bigger, a bigger factor. So you see this also as them being uh, proactive to try to detract from potential, uh, well, backlash. Uh, I think it's and, and. Mm -hmm. So I don't see it either or. Uh, I mean, we haven't seen a real economic crisis in China for, for a long time, but I think it is as China converges to a growth rate that you would expect yeah. at its level of income, other factors are becoming a bigger role. China's bigger role internationally is one of those. And I do believe that's why this common prosperity just fits right in. And that's why I think it will come. Uh, it, it may take a while, but China ends up doing usually the rational thing after a while. So I do expect that. But yes, this, this nationalism, I mean, it, it's there. And um, other countries, to some extent, have to deal with it. Uh, I live in Indonesia now. I used to live in Singapore. Uh, it plays quite big in that part of the world because you know, the pressures of China in the South China Sea and elsewhere are real. But at the same time, also the economic benefits of China and China's growth are also very, very real. So it's, it's uh, a delicate situation for countries yeah, in Southeast Asia. <laughs> well, I believe this is a very good time to look at our audience, see if there are any questions. Uh, yes, we can go there. So the mic will come to you. <laughs> A person with a mic, to be clear. <laughs> Hi, uh, good to get the words uh, with you. Um, I have a question about um, the social um, troubles that China brings in their own country and internationally, given that uh, the, Ber the wall in Berlin fell down, and we looked at that as the end of a Cold War. Uh, China also looked at that, and they wanted perestroika, but not glasnost. So we haven't seen a demilitarization on both sides. Do you think that this will bring problems, given Taiwan and the modern Africa uh, colonization through their modern colonization strategy with a new Silk, silk Road they are um, enforcing? Okay, there's a, lot, there's a lot to unpack, but um, so on Taiwan, I mean, China's position is, is, is quite clear, and it may be uncomfortable, but everybody's position, including the Netherlands, is that, look, you know, both sides of the strait agree that there's only one China. China says there's the one China principle, i.e. Taiwan is ours. Their preference, everybody's preference, no, the US and others think it must be peaceful reunification. China's strong preference, as expressed, is it should be peaceful, but we will not preclude using forceful means to get what is our right. So that's Taiwan. Um, on the Belt and Road, uh, when I was in the World Bank, I actually tried to get the World Bank engaged in the Belt and Road. It didn't happen because Trump became president and it all became, oh, the Belt and Road is bad. We haven't seen anything yet, but it's bad and it's bad governance and it will, it will corrupt the whole world. And uh, frankly, if you look at those countries where Belt and Road projects are, by and large, it's not without mistakes. Big infrastructure is not without mistakes. But by and large, countries are positive about the contribution of Belt and Road to their development. There is there 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 are there are poster children like the Hambantota, the Hambantota port in Sri Lanka, way before the Belt and Road Initiative started. It was it was agreed, and frankly, it was a white elephant. People knew it from the start. The World Bank did investigations on it, and they yes, they agreed it was a white elephant. So so, but the using some of the surpluses which do arise in China's rapid development, using it for investing in other countries, it's similar to what 
Japan has done, what Korea has done, what even Western countries, what the United States did in Europe after the war. So uh, I, it's not necessarily colonialism because the countries have agency. They can say, well, actually, you know, we, we prefer to get money from the Europeans or from the World Bank or elsewhere, uh, but they take it from China. I think there are cases as such, yes, where where some of the some of the belt the investments done under the Belt and Road banner were done by a regime that did not represent the greater good for the, its people. But I think that's the exception rather than all. But the exceptions are not unimportant. I, I'm not denying the importance of it. But I don't think that the Belt and Road was a neo-colonial exercise and therefore it was bad. No, that, that's, that's not the case. And frankly, uh, having worked for the World Bank, the World Bank had a problem because they didn't invest in infrastructure anymore, and shamefully so. We did wonderful things uh, in, in social, in education, and social safety, and that's a very, very big lending program of the World Bank going to social safety, but not in infrastructure. Not in infrastructure, far less than, say, in the 70s or the 80s. So I think it's, it was in part a failing of, of the existing international financial institutions where China saw a, a gap. Um, we'll have uh, some more time for audience questions later as well. Thanks for that question. Uh, very interesting. We're going to uh, have more time later as well. Oh, yeah. okay. No, so, so you know. <laughs> you can keep those questions. Um, so we also want to talk about, and you already mentioned it, uh, but China has long been known as the world's factory, at least during, I think, my entire lifetime. Uh, and now it's uh, trying to achieve more high quality growth. It's trying to diversify its economy uh, and it's trying to have a renewed internal focus. One important part of their economic strategy right now is the dual circulation policy. Uh, could you please walk us through this policy um, and its underlying rationale? Well, again, uh, it, it's not entirely clear what the policy actually is. But the idea behind the policy is really that China now needs to rely more on domestic demand, less on, on, on external demand. The, some of the underlying reasoning is, has to do with national security. Mm -hmm. China wants to be less dependent on others and more dependent on the critical supply chains that are onshore in China. Uh, China has achieved that. They're doing that. Uh, even before the policy was formulated, you saw a major shift of, of global supply chains to China, in part because of efficiency reasons, and everybody benefited from it, except some workers in declining industries in the West. But, uh, but the, the, the dependence on China is really quite big. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason is because they are the manufacturing house of the world, they have so much exports of intermediary goods, which then goes into, into manufacturers of other countries, that it's very hard to sort of imagine a, a, a decoupled world. It's very hard to, to, to say, okay, well, let's decouple from China because we don't like China's policies here or there, and we want to decouple more. We see there's a risk. Frankly, it's, it's, it's virtually impossible. Mm -hmm. I, I looked at the numbers for, for the Netherlands and for Singapore and for the US, but. But it, it's, it's stunning how much China's share in Dutch manufacturing is compared to Dutch share in Chinese manufacturing, which is negligible. Yeah, well, about that, what are the main obstacles then to reduce external dependence for China? Well, I mean, there's two. One is this demand issue. Yeah. They still don't have domestic demand. In fact, the dependence on exports <laughs> is mm -hmm. also a, a certain dependence, right? Yeah. So if you cannot generate your own domestic demand. And the second is technology. Uh, China is still you know, one or two generations behind. Uh, this is the home of ASML. And we'll have fun that so. Uh, China doesn't yet, yet have an ASML. Mm -hmm. It's also extremely hard to, to replicate uh, a, company, a company like that. And so they feel very vulnerable in that technology. You also see that their, their political reactions to the measures of the United States have been very sharp. They're really, really quite upset. And, and now they're trying to double down on what they call their indigenous innovation. Mm -hmm. And China has now surpassed the EU in spending on research and development as a share of GDP. Um, and uh, really to, to try and avoid this dependency on US 
technology. Mm. Uh, and, uh, but it's still there. Yeah. It's still there. We're now talking about s uh, semiconductors. There's yeah. many other areas where, mm -hmm. frankly, science is, is has been in the past 30 years after the wall fell, uh, was very much an international business mm -hmm. and a very much uh, uh, jointly the best minds working together across the, ac across the globe. And that has been enormously productive. Uh, now that seems to be drifting apart a little bit. Yeah, so as you mentioned, this uh, drifting apart, it seems to be a sort of global trend. Uh, we've also hear, heard a lot about French shoring recently. So that's when, um, also for the audience here, countries try to de-risk their supply chains by sourcing critical goods and materials from friendly nations. Uh, and this is also, of course, what we're seeing a little bit of in China, or a lot of. Um, a lot of people worry that if people are, all of the world's countries are very successful at this, uh, you remove a lot of um, deterrence, economic deterrence for conflicts. Um, this is, of course, worrying. But uh, do you think that this is an overly alarmist uh, line of thought? Well, I mean, it, it's, it's definitely a logical argument because let's, let's suppose you succeed and everybody is independent or there's big blocks in the world. That also means that the conflict, if there is any, mm -hmm. has very little damage. I mean, the, the capability of inflicting economic damage yeah. would withhold countries from seeking conflict to some extent. If you're completely separate, there's nothing more to lose. So that is a logical argument. I don't think that will be, even if you succeed in decoupling, it won't be today, tomorrow, it would take a 30-year trajectory, just as it taken a 30-year a trajectory for China to become that center of the global supply chain. But it's thinkable, it's not desirable. I mean, there's a reason why global supply chains emerged. Some would say a little bit, there was a little bit too much of it, fair enough, and economic, uh, environmentally, you can say, well, that may not be, uh, may not have all been a, a, as good as, as the economics says, or socially it may not always have been as good as the, as the economists say. But by and large, everybody benefited from it because production took place more fragmented in those places where it was done most efficiently. Economists love that. Mm, of course. Now, there's an, one big factor that does hold sway, and that's security. Yeah. Well... Talking so, about that and taking, you know, the ASML case you, you brought before, do you believe that restricting um, exports in the semiconductor technology is actually backed by a real security threat, or is it just, uh, so to say, um, an advantage that the U.S. and its trade allies want to gain over China? Well, I mean, what is a real... I, 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 you know, I'm not a military expert, so I can't really say, but I think it's fair f from a U.S. point of view. It, their argument is, look, it's, f it's fair that we're not, we don't want to give them the goods, China, the goods that would in the end destroy us. That's fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> but that already has a lot of assumptions. Yeah. Right? And, and I'm not sure whether that gets China right and the ambitions of China right. But it's almost like that Rubicon has been crossed because now it's very hard to go back yeah. mm -hmm. because China now reacts and the U.S. just sees more of, oh, look, now they're trying to do it themselves because they want to make bombs with this or something. So we're now in a downward spiral. Um, I think it's some, some of these things could have been better managed. I uh, Personally, some of your international relations people would know the Wassenaar Agreement, which is sort of the, the successor to the uh, a COCOM list that was sort of the restricted stuff that you couldn't trade with the Russians when the Russians were... Well, the last time the Russians were the enemy, they were the enemy again. That became the Wassenaar Agreement with the Russians in it. So they're basically an international agreement that says, okay, these are goods, these are dual use goods, they're too, too dangerous to trade without, without explicit permissions of government. <laughs> so everybody agreed on that. I, I wish, and you know, it's still, it's still on the books, it can still be done that such agreements would be done, would be made with China. Because if not, if not, there's enormous amount of uncertainty being created. Mm. And for, I mean, of course for China, but also for companies dealing with China. Can they do this? Can they not do this? Is this, is this risky or not? And not just for today, but also tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So it's actually quite detrimental for 
economic interaction with China, but also with the United States, yeah. frankly. But do you see these trade wars then escalating to other technologies, or do you think they're going to be more wary of this? Well, the, uh, first, the EU says, no, no, we, we don't want to decouple, we only want to de-risk. And, and there's, some, there's something in that, and actually they're, they're putting in the homework, they're putting you know, up lists of areas where they want to do this. Being very transparent about it, very open about it, actually, is actually very helpful. Uh, second, the United States, in a way they adopted the de-risking and say, no, we only want to protect small yards with high fences, but to keep as much of the economy open. Mm. But of course, it's all about the stuff that China really wants. Yeah. And it could be for very peaceful purposes, as well as for other purposes as well. So it will remain an issue of tension and conflict. You see also, you mentioned uh, EV uh, vehicles before, so like electric vehicles. Um, there's talk both in the US and the EU, of course, of increasing tariffs a lot, because you see a uh, huge development in China and a huge output of cheaper and often um, up to standard or better el electronic vehicles. So if this happens, are we, you know, and this escalates to cars and to other technologies as well, will we have a type of bipolar economic world then in the end? Uh, well, it's, def it's definitely a risk. I, I think the electric vehicles is, a, uh, is, is in a way a special case. It's an interesting case mm -hmm. because, frankly, well, people that were engaged in China, such as I, we, we could have seen this coming a very long time ago. China failed in internal combustion engines, cars. Basically, they failed. Mm -hmm. and, but they saw an opening because of the, the change in the world, i.e. the issue of climate change. They knew that electric vehicles was going to be a big part of the solution. And they were on that quite early on. Yeah. Western producers caught up very late, frankly. Yeah. So the, China has, has an advantage. For the EU, the problem is now that with weak domestic demand in China, suddenly you have the tsunami of cars coming from China. So what do you do? Well, the EU for now, and maybe they changed their policy, has said, oh no, we're going to prove that this is done, they, they are so, they're exporting this stuff because they are subsidized. And they've benefited from all these subsidies and therefore they're so competitive, it's not real. Mm -hmm. That's very hard to prove. And even if you can prove it, you need to prove it in the court of the WTO, yeah. which is not functioning. The only thing that China needs to do, if there is a judgment at the WTO, they need to appeal. And the United States has killed the appellate body, so there's no finality there. And it can take very, very long pro time. What I think is a very valid argument, and the past is the past, the e Europeans, they were slow, mm -hmm. but now there's you know, a very major industry at risk. Uh, of, of being overwhelmed by Chinese exports. Well, there's a solution for that. You can actually, in the WTO context, you can put up tariffs as part of an import surge. There's sp very specific pr provisions for that. So if you fear for your own industry because of an import surge from other countries, mm -hmm. you can say, well, wait a minute. We take measures. The trick, though, is that then you have to compensate the exporting country for that. So you're not saying this is bad or it is done by subsidies, but you do have to compensate for that. But it would save the European industry. I think that might be a very promising way to go. Yeah. Well, one key player that we haven't really touched upon in this interview, in this US-China rivalry, is Taiwan. And we hear a lot about Taiwan, and it's a very discussed topic here in you know, Western environments, so to say. Is the topic you know, as top of mind as it is for us, the Chinese people, as well? It's, I mean, it's extremely important. Yeah. The, what China calls the reunification of the Chinese nation is probably the number one priority. And frankly, it's a priority that can cost something. So in, in, in terms of would an economic threat with whole China back from uh, taking Taiwan, the answer is no, because it's just too important. But it is, not, it is not an urgent problem yet. Okay. One of the downsides, the, the Chinese grand strategy, if there is one, is now it's the, the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. I'm losing my mic again. <laughs> These are tricky. Let me try again. 
And Xi Jinping has said that project is going to be completed by 2049. Since the party congress last three years ago, yeah. reunification with Taiwan is part of that project. So there is now something of a deadline. It's not 2027, it's not next year, it is not 2035, uh, as a lot of Americans seem to imagine, but there is something of a deadline. Mm -hmm. So it is important that progress towards a peaceful solution of the problem, whatever that may be, yeah. is going to be achieved. But does Xi Jinping see it as part of his legacy, reunification? Well, Xi Jinping is a healthy man, but I'm not sure how whether he would last in leadership position till 2049. Yeah. And I think it's very important to him, just like it is for most Chinese. Okay, so it's not, uh, there's no reason right now to say that a definitive change will happen within the next few years. No, but it's also not something, as, as China increasingly demonstrate, you know, they also don't like infringement on what they see as their right mm -hmm. to... Uh, administering Taiwan at some point in time. Yeah. Uh, recently we had elections in Taiwan uh, and they elected a pro-independence president. Um, why, why the, do you, do you agree or no? Uh, Pro-status quo, I would say. I mean, okay. there is not really a pro-independence. Uh, if I ask the Taiwanese, and I had the pleasure of meeting quite a few of them, they say, well, why, wh we don't need to declare independence. We are the Republic of China. We were declared in 1912, we proceeded yeah. The People's Republic of China by uh, by thirty some years, and so we don't need to declare independence. Um, but a proponent of a more independent course, like just like the previous president, um, is is that's probably fair to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how have the elections been received in China? Well, I think China had already found peace with the fact that they were not going to get their the preferred candidacy uh, into into the into the presidency, uh, China is even though they fought with them, but China is more comfortable with the Kuomintang, mm -hmm. who has much stronger on this idea of one China than anybody else. So they're more comfortable with Kuomintang thinking uh, in in this respect. But uh, so they wish that the Kuomintang were stronger. But for now, they're more they're stronger local, but not but not nationally. So they're content to wait um, until a, a future uh, well, scenario. Com compared to, say, the Pelosi incident, yes. the reaction to the elections was far more subdued. And, and frankly, I, 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 was, uh, I was happy there was not more noise. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I believe we have some more time for audience questions now. There was an student here. Oh, yeah. he, was, okay. he was first. Absolutely. Uh, here in the front, Sean. <laughs> Um, whenever there came news out of China decades ago, it was about their one-child policy. And soon later we discovered that, or we learned as uh, Europeans, that Asian uh, um, parents would prefer a boy compared to a girl. Now they may be 25 years older and those boys are men who seek a spouse and can't find. So could you elaborate on that? Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a big issue. And, and there are, in those generations, there are tens of millions of men who mathematically will not find, find a spouse. Um, at the same time, society has changed and, and you know, it, it's no longer as damning to stay single. Part of the reason why this was Chinese tradition was that you always had to take care of your parents and for that to have a, a wife, let me just say it, I'm, it's politically very incorrect, but I'm just trying to it's this uh, reality, uh, display, no? display old Chinese philosophy. For that to have a wife was important because she would take, she would take care of the aging, aging parents de facto. I think times have changed, and so it is less of a, an issue for the elderly. I think it is still an issue for social social structure, if you want, and indeed having too many men, uh, young, young men, uh, potentially unemployed without a wife, that's not very healthy, and that can lead to tensions. I haven't seen much study on that. It's not my area of spe uh, specialization. 
But of course, the, the bigger issue is that indeed these single children in the end they have quite a bit of a burden to carry, even if it's not actually literally taking care of your parents, but financially taking care of your parents through a social system. And China is not yet fully prepared on that. As a fact, a lot of the rural population is really doesn't have very good pension systems at all, doesn't have very good health care insurance. They have some now, but it's very, very minimal. And there's this big wave of aging uh, people coming. So uh, it's, it's becoming increasingly urgent to find, to find a solution. One of the upsides is that, that look, because the overall labor force is going to go down, that is that even those young men who may not have a wife, they're probably going to find a job. Well, I think we have time for one other question, if there are any. Yes, right there, Sean. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, actually, three, uh, three days before, I was actually in Shanghai, in China. And when I talked to my friends there, I found a very big issues nowadays for Chinese economy is all the consumers, they are losing confidence. So they are saving a lot instead of investing on stocks or investing on you know, real estate. And also, I, find, I talk to people working in finance, they are saying that these foreign investors, they are leaving the country. So there is something called anything but China. So they want to invest in anywhere in the world but not China. So if, if you want to find a solution for Chinese government, what can they do to restore the confidence for the consumers and for the foreign investors? All right. Well, look, that loss of confidence has a history. And I think sort of gradually chiseling at that history would solve the problem. The history on the consumer side is really, and you can look at the indicators for consu consumer confidence, it collapsed during the Shanghai lockdown. It was the moment where confidence collapsed and it didn't come back. On the foreigner side, it is much more the overall business environment. At some point, people thought that common prosperity meant the end of this capitalist nonsense in China and therefore clamping down on platform companies, on Alibaba, on Tencent, on, on games, on everything. And that really affected confidence of many people who were in entrepreneurs, domestic or foreign, and they lost confidence and therefore stopped investing. Uh, there's been a lot of talk that the party still loves entrepreneurs, as in fact it is in the, <laughs> in the Chinese constitution, so it must be true. <laughs> but I think it takes more than words. And just so gradually over time, when those actions, new policy actions fall into place of a government that is still relatively new, I think that will gradually restore confidence. But it, it requires some patience from the government side. Well, thank you very much for all of your questions. So, well, we've seen that the distance between China and the West seems to be growing on a diplomatic, economic, and ideological level. Are you more optimistic or concerned about this future? No, I'm, I'm quite concerned. And that's the, I mean, it's because the direction that China has decided to take, but also very much what the thinking is in the United States and some other parts of the world. Um, there's not enough common ground. Mm -hmm. and you know, the United States. Oh. Microphone issue. Try again. Try again? Yeah, there, there we, we are. Go. I was already trying to get my <laughs> <laughs> little switch here. Um, <clears throat> so uh, Kevin Rudd, the, uh, the uh, former prime minister of Australia, he, he wrote a book of the, the, um, uh, the, 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 and he said that the, the decade of living dangerously is, is now on. And that is in part because China trying to find its feet as being a big leader in the world. The United States not necessarily being comfortable with that and having lots of domestic issues themselves. That's not a great time. So the communication between the two is not great. Um, as a, not an engaged bystander in uh, now living in the region, you know, I, I see from both sides, and I think there's a lot more opportunities to find common grounds and common purpose rather than there is for conflict. We talked about Taiwan. It's one of the most difficult issues uh, there, there is, that is around. But in many other areas, solutions are there if there's only uh, room for discussion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what a lovely way. I, we actually we were going to end it. I did, not plan, too good to, yeah. I did not plan that. I did not plan that.
That's great. Um, so I want to say thank you so much for sharing your insight today. Uh, thank you very much also to the audience for joining. Um, <laughs> thanks. Um, so if you enjoy this interview and you want to see more interviews like it, we have one coming up next week, 14th of February. It's with the Netherlands response to Oprah. Uh, that would be Tvan Heis for the people here who know him. Um, that will be 1 to 2 p.m., by the way. I hope I mentioned that. Yes. Let's give one other round of applause for Mr. Hoffman.